Hello Docker fans. Um, good to have you here today. Um, I'm going to do a presentation about uh, our latest release, Docker 1.11. Um, and I don't know if you can see my screen here, but I've got a presentation. Um, yep, just got confirmation you can see my screen. Excellent. <laughs> Um, so this release is a um, it is one of those releases where on the surface uh, it doesn't seem like a whole lot of change, lot has changed, but we've done a huge amount um, under the covers uh, to change things for the better, which will hopefully, from your point of view, um, nothing you know there's no new shiny, but everything will uh, generally sort of work a little bit better. Um, and I'm going to go through some of those things uh, that have changed today, give you a little sort of um, delve into the sort of guts of some of the new bits of Docker, um, uh, and also show, show you some of the new user-facing user features. Um, but going to leave a whole bunch of time at the end for questions, because um, you know that is why this is an interactive thing rather than just a YouTube video, is that uh, you can ask me stuff and uh, I can answer your questions. Um, so let's get started here. Uh, the big thing that's changed in Docker 1.11 um, is a completely new foundation that we're building uh, Docker on top of. So last June, we announced a new thing called the Open Container Initiative, uh, which was a initiative amongst essentially everyone in the uh, industry to agree upon a standard for what a container is because um, that is kind of the point of what a shipping container for software is is that every, everyone agrees on what a shipping container for software is uh, the the ecosystem for software um, will 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 blossom because everything is compatible with everything. Um, and uh, for a long time, Docker sort of became the de facto standard for what a shipping container for software is just because lots of people started to use it. Um, but it was important for us that we became, that we wanted to, it to become a proper standard uh, because um, we didn't want it to just be locked up into the you know, piece of software that Docker, Docker was, but essentially allow anyone else to use it. Um, the the sort of reasoning behind that is that uh, is, is that sort of it is in everyone's interest if we can all share a standard, um, uh, just because that like, we want people to be competing on the quality of their products rather than uh, the fact, you know, that we have a, a, a standard for a container that just works with Docker. Um, so this is what the OCI is about. Um, essentially, everyone in the industry uh, is involved in this. Um, and some sort of discussion has been going on uh, for a while to sort of solidify what the standards are. Um, and we're pleased to say that this is now the first Docker release, which is based on top of the OCI spec. Um, the way it works is that we, we've contributed a piece of software called Run C to the Open Container Initiative. And Run C is based upon the technology that Docker was based upon, um, which was originally a Golang library called libcontainer. Um, and Run C is essentially a standalone binary of the of the lib container um, of the lib container library uh, and that is the thing that docker is based upon um, and what we've what we've also done is we've implemented this using a new piece of infrastructure plumbing that we've released a thing called container D uh, now what container D is is that it's a really simple uh, daemon that sits on top of run C for essentially orchestrating multiple run C instances. So if you imagine run C as the, the single container, it's just a really simple binary that just runs a container giving, given a OCI, given an OCI um, uh, image. And 
uh, then just runs the container as its child process. Uh, what container D is that it's a whole bunch of other functionality that was inside Docker that we've yanked out into a separate piece of uh, separate piece of plumbing. And it's essentially a uh, a CRUD interface around around run C containers. So it's just a daemon that sits there and has an API for starting, stopping, creating, removing uh, containers. Um, so that piece of infrastructure can be can be reused in any of your applications if you if you want if you want it to. Um, but it's it's also a thing that we use inside Docker. And the best way to explain this is probably with a little diagram. This is just how sort of all of the things connect together. So um, before all of this was just sort of locked up inside the Docker engine daemon. Um, but now uh, the Docker engine daemon talks to another daemon called container D and then container D uh, starts and orchestrates run C containers. Um, so from your point of view, if you're just using Docker, you would actually notice nothing new. Um, but what's interesting about this is how all of the sort of guts and internals have changed around. Um, and I thought it might be interesting because you are here and uh, an enthusiast. Uh, I thought it might be interesting to go through some of some of the guts, uh, just to sort of give you give you an idea of some of the architectural changes that have um, uh, that, that have gone on. Um, this is this is like a sort of do not try this at home uh, warning now. In that uh, this is this is stuff that you probably wouldn't do in your day to day work, but if you are interested in how Docker works or you are interested in integrating with container D, because that's kind of the whole point of why we have this, um, why we have this new system. Uh, this is, uh, this is the, these are the sort of things that you'll be uh, interacting with. So I am going to uh, open up a shell here. Uh, quite nice and big, so hopefully you can see. Uh, this is just a Linux machine that is um, running Docker and on this machine, um, if we look for our Docker processes, um, we can see we've got the normal Docker daemon here. Um, but also running alongside uh, the Docker daemon is a thing here that we've got, got called container D. Um, and as I explained before, um, container D is a separate standalone um, runtime. So this is the thing that is actually running your containers and the Docker daemon is, is just communicating with container D to run your containers. Um, and all of the container D stuff now is um, is in a directory called uh, var run docker lib container D, uh, which is a new thing. And inside this directory, we have um, we have a, uh, a a container D socket, which is the which is the socket that uh, Docker uses to communicate with container D. Um, and if you're interested, this is a um, gRPC API, um, which is all documented on the on the container D uh, GitHub repository. Um, and what we've also got is we've got a um, command called CTR. Um, here it's prefixed with Docker Dash just because we're distributing this as part of the Docker um, the part of the Docker package. But if you install Container D standalone, it's not going to have the Docker prefix because it isn't actually it isn't actually in of itself tied to Docker in any way. Um, and what we can do here is we can pass in the address of our Docker socket, which uh, run Docker lib container D um, dot sock and list of containers, and nothing's running yet. Um, but if we uh, if we run some kind of container. 
um, and run that again, we can see we've got a running container here. And uh, this is essentially the equivalent of, you can see this, this is Docker PS, this is Docker container, the CTR containers. Um, these are kind of the equivalent things. And we can see here that we've got um, this Docker container here, which is backed by this container D container. And in um, the container D listing, we can see that it's got a path. And this is essentially the path that contains this container with everything that is running that is in the current directory that we're in at the moment. So we've got this new directory here, which is the containers ID. And in this directory, just sort of dig into some of how, how this is working. Uh, what we have here is an OCI container. And this file here, config.json, is the file which describes um, oh, I haven't got a JSON format on this machine. Sorry, you got to pass a big compressed blob of JSON, but you can't <laughs> can kind of see what's going on here. Um, uh, and um, what we can see here that the first the first line is um, uh, th this is saying what the OCI container version is, um, and uh, this, this is um, essentially the thing that we have standardized on as part of the OCI. Um, and we've got the OCI version, we've got the platform, we've got the process, and what process this is, which is an Nginx. Um, and in this directory, we've also got the root file system, which is the root file system of the container, and a bunch of sockets for getting standard in and standard out and stuff like that. Um, that is essentially the guts of how libcontainerd, it's quite simple really. Um, and the beauty about this all using the standard OCI format is this OCI format doesn't necessarily need to be um, consumed by run C. So run C is a thing which runs Linux containers. It, this can actually be consumed by anything that is um, that understands this format. So um, it could be an alternate Linux container runtime. It could be something which takes this blob of JSON and actually runs it on a runs it on a virtual machine instead of a Linux container. Um, it could be all sorts of things. Like there are loads of uh, possibilities now about how you can swap in and out container runtimes. Um, and this is still very early stage. In that, um, if you want to be able to swap out. Um, the run C runtime inside Docker with an alternate container runtime. Um, you're probably going to run into some rough edges and stuff like that, but this is definitely the start of allowing you to be able to, you know, swap out bits of Docker with different bits of different bits of plumbing to be able to customize how it works. Um, and we're quite excited about this. Um, um, and what else about container D? Oh, and container D is all sort of event-based. So um, the other command here, apart from containers, is a uh, events command. Um, and so uh, I'm going to log into this machine. Another terminal. And we've got this. Oops, we've got this container running here. If I stop this container. Um, we can see here that uh, in container D that the event has come through saying this container has stopped. So this is kind of how um, you integrate with container is by using this event system to sort of uh, to keep to keep track of what's going on. Um, so yeah, that's container D. Um, uh, we're quite excited about this, um, both from the point of view of making. Docker much more modular and making Docker much more reliable. So this is a much more um, solid foundation for Docker to be building on. Um, um, we're also quite excited about this from just the, the, the point of view of uh, open standards and you know people being able to um, uh, customize uh, Docker with different runtimes and stuff like that. Um, so that's container D. Um, that is pretty much the sort of big architectural change that has happened inside Docker. Um, 
what we've also got in this in this release is a whole bunch of other neat stuff. Um, I think um, certainly the, one of the most exciting things is in Docker's networking system, we've now got um, sort of rudimentary support for load balancing between different containers. And this is done by using DNS round robin. Uh, so the idea is that if you start multiple containers which have the same alias, so you've given given them the same name essentially, um, if you try to resolve that name from another container inside the same network, it will randomly return um, the names of the, the, the IP addresses of those two containers. So the best way to demonstrate that, this is using a demo. Um, what I'm going to do is create us a network. Um, this is new, using Docker's new networking system with the top level networking command, which we introduced a couple of releases ago. And then I'm going to start two containers, um, both of which are, are going to be inside this network. So I'm going to say their network is example, and I'm going to give them both a alias. I'm going to give this an alias of Redis. Um, I'm going to start it in the background, and it's going to be the Redis image. So this is a container which is Redis, and its host name is also Redis. So this is going to pull Redis here. And then start it up. So we've got Redis running, and I'm going to run that command again to get a identical Redis image. Uh, Redis container, sorry. And they're both going to have the same alias. So if we look at Docker PS, we have two containers here that are Redis. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I am going to um, start off a interactive terminal um, inside this same network, so inside the example network. And um, And oops, Docker run. And just going to start a really simple shell. And what I'm, what happens now is because I'm in the same network and because we've got two Redis containers with the alias Redis, I can ping Redis from this, from uh, this, uh, this container, and it's going to resolve to the first time. It's going to resolve to one of the containers. And the second time is going to resolve to the other container because um, it's now um, so it's not it'll eventually get to the other one that it's randomly assigning me a different IP address um, from either of those two containers. Um, now this is uh, probably not something you would want to use for a uh, a sort of advanced high traffic uh, HTTP load balancing system, um, but if you wanted to do some really um, simple load balancing between sort of two different containers you've got. Um, um, this is a really good solution to this. And uh, I'm sure uh, if you've been trying to do some sort of high availability stuff with Docker, you're going to find a uh, sort of useful place in your apps for this to, to, the, to this use. So that's um, that's DNS round robin load balancing. Um, other thing we have in this release uh, is a um, a plug pluggable client credential store. Now this is um, previously in Docker uh, when you logged into a registry, your credentials were stored in a file on disk. Um, um, in your home directory, which is docker slash config.json. Um, and the way your credentials are stored is now pluggable with a plugin. Um, so uh, you can store it, for example, in, in uh, keychains um, or in any, any sort of secret store that you might have in your, in your infrastructure. Um, you know, if, 
if it's if it's on client desktop machines, you might want to store it in the OSAN keychain, and on, in production, you might want to store it in a, in a secret store. So there's loads of flexibility about what you can do with this if you want to um, store or retrieve your credentials from various places. Um, this is not actually in the current toolbox release for desktop, um, just because um, uh, we haven't got support yet for the client credential store in a bunch of um, bunch of our other projects apart from Engine, um, so we haven't yet you know flipped the switch on Toolbox. But this, if you want to sort of um, play around with this stuff, uh, what is this? Um, this is up on oh where is it? Uh, Docker credentials helper. Sorry, if you go to uh, Docker's credentials helpers um, on GitHub. Um, then there are a whole bunch of examples on how to build these, uh, build and use these plugins. Um, uh, so if you want to build plugins for your own infrastructure and stuff like that, um, go here and all of the uh, lots of examples of how they work. Um, That's the client credential store. Um, it's another sort of extra bit of security goodness inside Docker. Um, we've also got in this release the YubiKey hardware signing, um, which we added in a couple of releases in the experimental version. Um, but what this this is now in the stable mainstream release. Uh, what this lets you do is you've got if you've got a YubiKey um, and you want to sign images with Docker Content Trust, uh, you can now use a private key that is stored on your hardware USB YubiKey. Um, so the idea is that um, you can build images and sign it with this hardware key, um, and you can configure engines that run those images um, that they will only be allowed to run if they've been signed with this YubiKey hardware. Uh, hardware key. Uh, so the idea is that um, in production you can ensure that the only stuff that runs is stuff that has been signed by people in possession of this actual piece of hardware. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, and this is sort of built into the whole um, whole sort of uh, image pipeline as well. So in um, DTR, which is uh, Docker Docker Trusted Registry, which is our commercial um, commercial image registry. Um, it also supports sort of checking that you know any images that have been pushed have been signed with this key, um, and so all the way you know along your sort of software pipeline, you can ensure that uh, you're running images that have come from a trusted place. Um, so this is kind of cool, um, sort of. Another extra piece of security goodness, I suppose, inside Docker. Um, the other thing we've got is um, Docker's internal service discovery system, which I just sort of demonstrated with that round robin load balancing system. That is actually a DNS server running inside Docker, which is resolving those host names. This now supports uh, AAAA records. Uh, which are ICT6 records. Um, so if you want Docker to integrate with your IPv6 infrastructure, or if you want to ensure that you know your Docker stuff is future-proof, um, we now support returning IPv6 addresses in our service discovery system. Um, another useful thing, as if you're building on top of uh, networks and um, networks and volumes. Um, or if you're building on top of the Docker API, sorry, <laughs> and using networks and volumes, uh, we um, now support attaching arbitrary metadata against networks and volumes. So this is something we added a few releases ago with containers and images, it's essentially just letting you, in the API, you can attach just arbitrary, um, arbitrary key value metadata to containers and images. Um, in the API and the CLI, actually. Um, 
and this just lets you um, do all sorts of well, essentially, just let you let you integrate with any existing systems you have in a in a completely flexible um, flexible way. So you can, um, if in your infrastructure you want to keep track of who's been building images, you can sort of attach, you know, um, metadata about who's been building and where they've been built to the image, and use that to trace things. And to containers, you could attach metadata about sort of what types of containers they are and um, all sorts of the, all sorts of these these things. Um, this now works with networks and volumes as well. So you can just essentially, if you want to integrate Docker with um, existing systems that you've got, you can attach you can attach arbitrary metadata to, to networks and volumes, which is quite useful. Um, so that's the highlights in. Uh, the Docker engine, a um, whole bunch of other smaller things as well, um, and which we will uh, send around the full release notes and full blog post for this stuff in a follow-up email uh, if you're interested in digging much deeper into this stuff. Um, beyond the Docker engine, we've also got a bunch of new stuff in Swarm Compose and Registry. Um, so in the last release, we added a feature to Swarm which would reschedule uh, containers if a node in your swarm died. So um, the idea is that if you had, if you had a swarm um, and the node died and it had containers running on it, um, swarm would realize that that node has died and um, automatically reschedule to containers to other, other nodes in your swarm to ensure that whatever services were on there um, kept on running. And this is now um, fully stable and ready to use in uh, production. And there's much more details on how to use this feature in, uh, the, the, in the blog post as well. Um, another thing we've added to Compose is, uh, this is a really common pattern for using Compose, uh, is there's now a dash dash build option on when you run Docker Compose up. Um, and what this does is it's just a shorthand for running Docker Compose build and then Docker Compose up, um, which was a really common pattern for people who use Compose, because um, Compose doesn't build by default when you run up. The reason for this is that sometimes builds take a long time, um, so we didn't want it to be slow by default, but if you've uh, built your image in an efficient way, uh, building is really quick, so you can now just do this on every on every time you run up by passing the dash dash build option to ensure your development environment is always in a fully up to date state. Um, another thing we've added to compose is the exec command, which is just um, it's just the the mirroring of the engine exec command for executing stuff against compose services in sort of the same way you can run stuff against compose services. Uh, and in registry, um, we have, um, <laughs> it sounds like quite a simple thing to be adding to registry, um, but uh, you can now fully delete images that you've got inside your, inside your Docker registry. So when you deleted stuff in, in a registry uh, before, um, all it did was just delete the reference that was pointing to the actual uh, pointing to the actual images that were stored in your store, such as S3. Um, what we've now added is an extra tool for the administrators of a registry um, that is a garbage collector that will go through all of your registry data and figure out which which bits of data aren't being used anymore and actually delete them from your store. Um, uh, and I mean, <laughs> this this sort of sounds like quite a a, a, a simple thing to do um, in your registry is to actually delete images. But um, if you want a little bit of sort of background into why why this was, is that we we had to sort of make a, a as with um, a lot of things, this was a sort of design trade-off when we first designed registry 
in that we wanted it to be um, um, in that we wanted it to be efficient to add images to a registry um, and trading off making it maybe a bit slower to delete images and um, just in the, in the way that registry is designed it's actually um, a very difficult thing to be able to figure out which images that need to be deleted because the way that Docker images work is it is it shares a whole bunch of data um, you know image layers are shared between between images so we can efficiently store lots of images and just by the way that this works um, figuring out which layers aren't pointed to by any images anymore um, is actually quite a quite a difficult thing to be able to be able to be able to figure out um, and it's it's similar to if if you know how um, um, uh, sort of uh, language runtimes work. This is similar to garbage collection operations inside um, inside software as well, where uh, you can have multiple variables inside a um, inside a piece of software that point to a single bit of memory, um, and then it uses a counter to figure out um, to figure out sort of when that bit of memory is not used by any by any um, by any variables anymore, and then a garbage collection operation, and then actually goes and clears up that bit of data from from memory. Very similar thing to how registry works, um, and we have very simple, naive offline garbage collector at the moment. Um, but uh, this is a pluggable system, so you can you can expect smarter garbage collection systems to be added in the future, um, in the same way that there's lots of different garbage collection systems for um, sort of language runtimes. Um, anyway, short story. You can <laughs> long story short, you can now delete images in the registry, uh, which is quite useful if you want to free up space in your registry. Um, so that is pretty much all of the um, big pieces inside the Docker 1.11 release. Um, if you want to go dig into some of these things in some more detail, uh, we'll be sending around the, uh, the blog post and release notes for this release um, uh, afterwards. Um, now what we're gonna do is hand over to questions because um, uh, I'd love to dig in Sort of more interested in, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here, um, uh, so I can see. Um, see some of your questions. Um, please send them over the chat in the WebEx uh, in the WebEx thing, um, and I will uh, answer them in, in order. Um, as I see them. A uh, question from Josh Campbell, does Docker support containers having multiple net alias flags? Um, yes, I think. Um, I'm pretty certain, yeah, you can attach, well, I like, would we'll test that right now, actually. <laughs> um, uh, the I yes, the idea is that you can attach, uh, yes, I've just tested that, and yes, you can apply <laughs> multiple, Aliases. Um, the the idea of an alias is that you can you can give a container a name using the dash dash name flag, but that name has to be uh, unique amongst all of the containers because it's used as a shorthand in some of the uh, commands. So you can do Docker stop name, and that has to be a unique name. Um, but the idea of the alias was to be able to attach. Uh, multiple names that you could attach and that you could talk to a container to from a um, from uh, from within a network. So yes, it supports multiple flags. Um, question from Soon Keller: Will the label capability on networks and volumes enable UCP to restrict access to them? Uh, yes. So in fact. Um, one of the reasons we had networks and volumes um, was for access control in uh, UCP. Um, 
so this is, is enabling this feature in UCP, um, but you can also use it in similar systems inside uh, your own your own uh, systems too. Um, so in uh, UCP, uh, there is a um, there are sort of concepts of access control where you can give certain users only access to certain certain resources inside a swarm, so only certain containers, certain images, certain networks, and certain volumes, and so on. Um, and UCP actually builds on top of labels to be able to, to to track which users you've given access to which of these resources. Um, so yeah, that's that's actually <laughs> it's a great example of a feature you can build on top of um, labels inside Docker Engine. Um, um, yep. Um, Adam asks. How is Docker for Mac coming along? When do we get access to the beta? Yes, lots of people have been asking uh, asking this question. Um, sorry about that. Um, so Docker for Docker for Mac is a new experience um, that we've got for Docker, which is um, it's essentially a native application for running Docker applications on uh, on Mac and Windows. Um, uh, it is um, essentially, um, I mean, f from uh, your point of view, the most exciting about thing, thing of it is it gets rid of the need for VirtualBox. Um, so it, it ships as an application on a Mac, it's docker.app, and you just run that application and then just Docker starts working and you don't have to worry about it. Um, and there's lots of very cool technology that uh, is behind it, but I'm not even going to explain what it is because the beauty of it is the magic that it just works. <laughs> um, um, and if you're interested in this, go to beta.docker.com and sign up uh, there. Um, um, we do have a uh, um, a quite a long waiting list. Um, but the reason for that is purely, purely, um, purely technical reasons. Um, in that we just don't want to let in, um, let in the floodgates of sort of uh, loads of people using this beta. While we're, not, we're sort of not sure if it, if it, um, you know, partly, partly us surrounding the whole support load, and partly we don't want to ship something that's really broken to loads of people. <laughs> Um, so we want to be confident that it works for all sorts of people's use cases um, and uh, all of that sort of thing before we before we let everyone um, let everyone run it. Um, for but but one thing we don't want to do is we not we're not sort of artificially limiting it to this. So the people on here as enthusiasts, um, we can I'm trying to think of the best way to do this actually. Um, we can probably we, we can circulate my email afterwards, um, and if you sign up on beta.docker.com um, and send me an email with your hub username, um, I can get you on the beta because we do want we do want people trying this out, and particularly enthusiastic people like yourselves who have uh, attended a webinar like this. We we really want we really want feedback from that. Um, so if you Promise to try it out and send us an email with any feedback you've got, you know, both both positive and negative. Um, uh, send me an email and we can we can get you on the beta. Um, so, do 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 do. A uh, question from Krishnandu. Um, <laughs> an interesting question actually. What's the best use case for Docker? Um, Gosh, so this is stepping back a bit, um, but I would like to answer this question because it's really good to have perspective around what Docker is really good at, um, particularly for people who are on, on the call who are uh, new to Docker and perhaps some also some veterans who, um, uh, you know, want to be reminded of, of why Docker is really great. Um, so Docker is a... a 
shipping is made of putting your software inside, um, which sort of enables this platform for building, running, and shipping software. So the fantastic use case for Docker um, is essentially um, for moving Docker around your um, your 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 um, sort of application production line. So your your software lifecycle, um, all sorts of words that are used to describe that, depending on depending on what sort of company you're in. Um, but essentially, this idea that you build software on your laptop, then it goes to um, a sort of test stage where it might be run in CI and run on testing environments and checked off by QA and stuff like that, and then gone off and run in production on run on on production systems, um, and your laptop and your build and test systems and your production systems are all kind of different. Um, and what you want to be able to do is describe your software in a way that it just works on all of these systems and can be passed from system to system without depending on the underlying, underlying infrastructure. Um, so uh, enabling that build pipeline um, is really the best use case um, for Docker where you want your developers to be able to wrap up a piece of software in development and ship that off to off to build and test, um, and then ship that off to production environments, um, and your software is all contained entirely inside um, a Docker container. Um, that is what Docker is great at, um, um, and um, lots of similar variations on that sort of end-to-end -end build pipeline of like providing a containers as a service system where operations teams inside organizations want to be able to sort of um, define a platform for running software and developers want to be able to put their software inside something so it can be run on that platform. Um, and that is another thing that Docker is great at is, um, is being this uh, standard um, sort of, well, this, this standard for how um, a container as a service sort of system can uh, can can run and how developers and operations teams can interface with each other um, and so that is yeah that's what Docker's great at um, and obviously we have a lot of um, software as well to support all of those um, use cases and development we've got toolbox and Docker for Mac and um, Dev and test, we've got DTR, and in production, we've got UCP um, to support UCP and Docker Cloud to sort of support all of these, um, all of these sort of different different use cases. Um, let's see. Tim asks, moving from Docker Engine in 1.10 to Run C and Container D in 1.11 seems a pretty major change in terms of the runtime. Is this a fair statement? Um, it depends what you mean by major. Uh, yes, this is a really major change in Docker's architecture. Um, it is a major change for the better in terms of architecture, um, in terms of um, uh, Docker is less of a big sort of monolithic thing that does everything. We're sort of splitting it out into components to do one thing well. Um, Container D has been built from um, almost the ground up. It's still, <laughs> it's at its very base. It's still based. It's still running on top of the same container, um, uh, container uh, primitives that that were powering Engine 1.10. Um, but architecturally, this is a much better change in terms of uh, in terms of reliability. Um, for example, just to take one example about what this architectural change lets us do is that now, now container D is a separate daemon to the Docker engine daemon that's running on your system. Um, in theory, you can restart the Docker engine and upgrade the Docker engine without ever having to stop container D and stop your containers. Um, 
because Containerd is running as a se separate daemon and all of your containers are child processes of Containerd. Um, so this is just sort of one example of where that architecture is really helpful. That is not actually you can't actually do that yet. So you can't you can't yet restart the Docker engine without restarting Containerd. Um, but that is something that we that is going to become possible soon because of that architectural change. Um, and another example is that because of container D's um, sort of really advanced event system, um, um, Docker is sort of now adding the ability to clean up zombie processes and stuff like that, um, which is something that wasn't possible before in the pre in the previous architecture. Um, so yes, it's a really big architectural change, um, but from the user's point of view, like from from your point of view, just using Docker, actually nothing changes at all. So you don't have to know that Container D is there, um, uh, and it's you know it's a big architectural change that has essentially um, causes almost zero changes to how users uh, use Docker, and that was that was you know, very intentional as well. Um, um, so we, did, we didn't want to break existing workflows and uh, all of that sort of thing. Um, Imran mentioned, asks, you mentioned DNS RAM Robin load balancing might not be a good fit if you have high traffic. Um, this is, uh, this is that, well, this is, um, uh, I suppose high, put a high traffic is the wrong way to put it. Um, I guess if you are running a, uh, I mean partly because DNS round robin load balancing is so simple, it's actually a, a very good fit for um, high throughput um, situations um, um, because um, your traffic isn't actually passing through any single point of single load balancer it is actually just the the dns system which is telling the client to point at different um different different servers so you, you actually lose a bottleneck there um, um but if you're running a uh, for example if you want to do web load balancing um, you probably want a more advanced system for doing http load balancing um, just because there's uh, HTTP load balancing is a really complicated problem, um, and you're, you're probably just not going to have a great experience if you try to try to do HTTP load balancing at a large scale with DNS round robin. Um, for that for that situation, you probably want to use something like AJ proxy. Um, it has whole load of extra features and management tools and all that sort of thing for doing high traffic HTTP load balancing. Um, um, so it's not to say that Docker's load balancing is not up to the job. It's just that if you want to do something very specialist like HTTP, well, a, a HTTP load balancer, you should probably use a special system to do that. Um, do, do, do. Um, let's see. Um, Tim asks, with these changes, um, there's potential impact to how you monitor Docker, particularly in the production environment. Um, any gotcha software upgrading? Yes, this is a really good point, actually. And um, with 1.11, um, if you are sort of manually running your Docker daemon, uh, you do need to be aware that uh, you do need to run a second daemon now. So you do need to run container D, and this is something you need to you need to set up. Um, there are a bunch of other details on how to set up and use container D in the documentation. Um, 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 it doesn't go into a whole load of detail in about how to monitor container D in production, oh, which is actually a really good point. 
Um, so we should probably follow up with that with more some more documentation and maybe a blog post or something. Um, uh, but yes, that's a really good point. Is that yes, there's a separate daemon now that you should uh, you should probably monitor. Um, in terms of the sort of metrics that ContainerD produces, all of those metrics are actually passed straight through to the Docker engine. So um, with ContainerD, you can monitor you know how many resources container, containers are using and stuff like that. Um, but that that is that then is passed through to the Docker engine in the Docker stats command. Um, which uses the container D API to get that information. Um, so if you're using things like Docker stats to monitor containers, that stuff isn't going to change with this container D container D migration. Tom asks, can we run numerous container D instances, or are we limited to one per runtime? Uh, currently, one per runtime, um, and that pretty much makes sense architecturally from uh, from what we're doing. Um, we're thinking about ways of how you would be able to run different types of run C implementations on a single Docker engine. So say you wanted to run one container on Linux containers and one container inside an alternate run C runtime, which run it inside a virtual machine or something like that. We're thinking about ways that we might be able to do that. Um, we're not sure quite how the architecture for that will work, whether that's a single container D instance or multiple container D instances, we're not really sure. Um, will Docker for Mac support participating in a Docker Swarm? No, not yet, sorry. Um, <laughs> for uh, that, the best way to, to do that is to still use, um, uh, still use Docker Machine to create swarms. Um, Docker for Mac is intentionally, it hides a lot of those details, uh, hides a lot of those details for you. Um, so it's, it's, it's as if your Mac was running a Docker engine um, and it's really intended to just be, just be that simple um, for running stuff on, on your Mac. Um, but more stuff there coming soon where we uh, are definitely aware that people want to be able to do that. Um, so yeah. Um, quick question from Troy. Any known issues regarding services that require Docker as a dependency? I presume this is in regards of to container D. Um, in his case, Kubernetes, no, this will keep on working fine with Kubernetes. It's because the uh, API that Kubernetes and any other systems that require Docker talk to the Docker API, um, and that is not changing at all. Um, so this is purely an architectural change under the hood and all of the CLI and APIs have not changed. Cool. Um, if you have any other questions, dive in right now with uh, your questions. But I think that um, that might be uh, that might be everything. Um, thank you very much for attending uh, attending this meetup. Uh, it's great to sort of go through some of that stuff and uh, also answer some of your questions. Um, um, and uh, what we'll do afterwards, we'll send around a link to the blog post with more details about this release and all of the release notes and stuff like that. Um, and we'll also send around my uh, email. So if you have any um, follow-up questions uh, or if you want access to the Docker beta, just send me uh, an email with your Docker Hub username. So first go to beta.docker.com, sign up with your Docker Hub account, and then email me your um, Docker Hub username. Um, uh, I can get you on the beta. And I would also love to hear how you're getting on with Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows, because um, we're extremely excited about uh, extremely excited about this. And, would love to hear what you um, what you think of it. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for attending. Uh, that is everything uh, from me. Um, and depending on what time zone you're in, have a great day or great evening um, or great week. Uh, and hopefully see you at a future Docker Online meetup. Thank you very much.